In the headlines with the deputy editor of Conservative Home, Henry Hill, and Daily Mirror columnist, Susie Boniface. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, the Times leads with a plea from the family of fugitive Daniel Khalif to hand himself in. Net zero obsession has fuelled inflation, according to Lord King on the front page of The Telegraph. He says it should not be the Bank of England's job to help the world with climate change. Andrew Flintoff is on the front page of The Sun, pictured for the first time since he was seriously injured in a crash while filming Top Gear. The Mirror leads with tributes paid to Queen Elizabeth II on the first anniversary of her death. They show the uh, Prince and uh, Princess of Wales pausing to remember whilst the King and Queen were in Balmoral. The weekend edition of the Financial Times leads with the continuing scandal surrounding degrading concrete in schools across the country. They say the government ignored warnings about dangerous buildings back in 2020. The Guardian says MPs have told the Prime Minister access to Covid jabs needs to be widened as concerns over the new Pirola variant grow. The Daily Express leads with a new report claiming ministers must stop bowing to human rights rulings made by woke judges which benefit bogus asylum seekers, terrorists and strikers. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined by Susie and Henry. Thank you very much for being here uh, in the flesh, as it were. Um, let's kick off with a look at the uh, front page of The Times. And uh, this is the family of um, Daniel Khalif actually, well, putting out a, a message to him to hand himself in. Susie. Yep, so this is a close relative, we don't know exactly whom, but it's said that he's a, he's a, a very intelligent, easygoing boy, that he loved army life, but in the past year or so, something seems to have changed. And they're saying that they think that he's, he's very, very frightened, and that's why he's run away. And it hasn't really been reported very much, but when Khalifa was first arrested, after um, there were some items found uh, in his barracks, he actually wasn't arrested on the spot and straight away. They didn't find him for about... 20 days, three weeks, he, again, he had gone on the run, and that was because he was apparently frightened and they found him later. So if perhaps the same kind of thing has happened, which wouldn't be a massive uh, stretch of the imagination, this isn't, you know, a dreadful mastermind at large in the, in the country. This is someone who's running away because he's frightened of something or facing the consequences or facing the court to try him for the alleged offences. Um, and the police are saying they think it's pretty close and they're going to get him soon kind of thing. But if that was the case, I don't think there'd be a £20,000 reward being put up and they'd be putting out pictures of the clothes he was wearing a week ago. Mm. The article, Henry, also saying that his uh, family, this close relative, is blaming the, the British Army for his, his downfall. But obviously there's no more detail than that. No, which is, and again, which is strange, because it does say, the other way, that he did love army life. And, you know, it's, it's hard to see how the army made him start collecting information. The things he's charged with or alleged to have done is, one, collecting information for a, for, that would be useful to a foreign power. He worked for the Royal Signals Regiment, which is an intelligence regiment which has access to lots of sensitive material. And I think there was something as well about creating mock bombs and leaving mm. them around the base. Now, now I don't think those are something that a mean drill sergeant has got him doing, right? So it's, it's natural for the family to want to try and shift the responsibility for this onto the armed forces, but maybe they'll substantiate that allegation in time, but at the moment, I don't think there's all that much to it. Mm. And the, the further detail that, that we read in the article, um, information from the close relative, uh, saying that the family are, are secular Iranians opposed to the, the present regime, Exactly, and we've all seen sometimes terrorist offences that have led to a terrible number of deaths. Other times people that are accused of offences, planning things that haven't quite come off. But quite often in those circumstances, without wanting to try to provoke sympathy for the people in question, um, there is a, a degree of being absolutely unhinged in it, of being mentally quite unwell. And I would suggest that um, some, I've, I've covered those cases where someone who's got very low IQs has been locked up for terror offences, but actually they've just gathered material because they were obsessive personality and things like this. I would suggest that if a soldier is only making a mock bomb, then he's 
probably, you know, generally speaking, they know how to make a proper one. <laughs> if, there are, if there are mock ones around the base, that's not good. It's obviously something they need to tackle, but I would suggest there may be something, perhaps the family mean, trying to read into it a bit, that um, there was a lack of duty of care, perhaps, if he was having any kind of mental health crises, that he wasn't getting the care and help he needed, and something went horribly wrong. I, I guess alternatively... I'm guessing a lot there, obviously, practicing. So we don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, you know if you're making a mock bomb, it's hard, it's a high-stakes yeah. It's a high stakes thing you know, to steal real yeah, explosives, course, right? Yes. But So, I, again, they could they could substantiate it, and it's important not to completely close your mind to it, but uh, there's another perfectly viable explanation, which is simply that you don't want to admit that your son has or nephew has done something like this, yeah. and therefore you can And we don't know, because yeah. he hasn't been, and we don't, he hasn't been no, caught so. and put on trial. No, yeah. no, but the, the new lines, um, as you say, coming out tonight, that £20,000 uh, reward for information leading to his arrest. And also, um, we've heard from Sir Mark Rowley, the Met Police Commissioner, saying that officers are now investigating uh, whether the escape was um, what, what's been termed an inside job. Yes, well, you know, there's the, there's the idea that you can't get, possibly get out of a prison unless you have some assistance, and that is... A possibility, but from what we've heard about Wandsworth Prison in the in the years and running up to this, not just recently, but certainly since the um, the breakout, it, it does seem to be quite easy to get <laughs> in and out of that prison. Um, it's probably slightly easier than getting the local bus, I would have thought. But um, you know, the, if you have a prison where guards, for example, either because they're being their families are under pressure and they're scared, or because they're open to corruption, or for other, any other reason, are allowing drugs and illicit mobile phones and so on to get into that prison, then by default, they're also not going to be doing quite the right checks necessarily when people are coming in and out. Mm. So, and I think one of the papers, I can't remember which one we saw it in now, but one of the papers is reporting that um, a few years ago, someone managed to get out of prison um, by having an illicit mobile phone, setting up a, a fake email account and emailing the, the prison officials with, a, with the bail restrictions, and they let him out on that basis. That really happened? Yes, I think, you know, we, I think you should yeah. get time off for that, because it was an absolute genius move. But, <laughs> but... Prison guard corruption is a real, is a real yeah. issue, especially to do with drugs. Uh, it's how most drugs get into prisons. So it would be, I suppose, irresponsible for the authorities not to check that. Really putting out the, this line from the, the police directly to Daniel Cleave that they're closing... In, in on him, um, if he, wherever he is, if he, he sees this, might this sway him to, to hand himself in, or do you think that this... I don't know. I think if you are on the run, you're not popping into the newsagents to buy a copy of the paper, uh, uh, whichever one he may choose to read. Of course he should read the mirror. Um, but I don't <laughs> think it's going to necessarily... I mean, if you are on the run and they can't find you, they're not... If, if they are close to, to finding you, they're, they're not to giving media, press statements like this he if they are about to find to, to well, media, I'll tell you, can he claim the £20,000 reward? They, they've, put the, they've put out a £20,000 reward for information. Could, could, you know, could he claim it? If, if, you know, he ha if he thinks he's going to get caught anyway, turn himself in, gets put in a trust account until he gets that out. I think yeah. that's quite a twisted question that we know, <laughs> yeah. the, the, we know the answer to. Um, <laughs> but just a, a bit more on, on the profile in the mirror, um, giving us a little bit more of an insight into the character. They're saying that he, he dreamed of using his skills to join the, the SAS. So someone that seemingly was happy in, in terms of his military life. Yeah, and he was, he was operating in signals, which already is a, a part of the army that deals with um, picking up uh, you know, electronic communications and providing electronic communications quite often on deployment with members of the special forces and supporting them in what they do. And he's a young lad and he was ambitious and it does seem to be that he had dreams and hopes for the future. Obviously, something has derailed mm. that yes. somehow. Yeah, we shall find out, uh, hopefully. Let's um, have a look at the FT weekend and this story about ministers ignoring advice uh, regarding uh, rack, the um, crumbling concrete. Take us into this, Henry. Right, so a few years ago, there was a, there was a panel drawing up a... A, a list of high-risk buildings, and the uh, official organisation of engineers recommended that any buildings with RAC be surveyed and then put on this list. And ministers, uh, it doesn't say why in the article, but we can speculate, ministers decided not to do this, which means that now that this scandal has hit, there is not a comprehensive database or list anywhere of what buildings have this material in it. Now, that causes a huge amount of distress for people because, obviously, you know, it, it is maybe only going to be a, a couple of hundred schools or even fewer, but if you think it's every school, that's going to worry a lot of parents. But it also means that we don't know the scale of the problem in hospitals, in courtrooms and in other parts of the public sector estate. So ministers, I think, are going to be under pressure to explain why they made this decision not to get out ahead of this a few years ago. OK, just to 
bring in a, another story because we're running out of time, Susie. I wonder if you can take us to The, the Guardian and this story about um, MPs advising uh, Rishi Sunak on widening access to uh, COVID jabs, to new COVID jabs. Yep, so it was decided this year not to bother rolling COVID jabs out for anyone who is under 65. And, of course, that includes some people in younger age groups but who have um, underlying health conditions that would technically put them in the same category as an over 65 because of their illnesses or chronic health conditions. Um, and they decided not to do it. Fundamentally, I mean, you could speculate as to whether or not it's to do with the cost or the expense or whether they've mm. got enough of them. But mainly it was because last year they realised when they were rolling these out there wasn't a very high enough take up of them amongst the general public. Most people felt the pandemic was over, they didn't need to panic or worry anymore, and therefore fewer and fewer people were getting the vaccines. Now we have a new variant, and it's, it seems to have more mutations and we have less protection than before. Not quite sure what impact, if any, it's going to have. And they're saying, well, actually, you do need now to, to widen this out to more people. Um, I am only in my 40s, but I'm in the over 50 group because I have epilepsy. And if they were providing it to the over 50s, I would therefore qualify and I would be protecting my older parents, my younger daughter. There are many people who have underlying health conditions or who have caring responsibilities, reasons that they want to have the vaccine. Of course, you can't do as you can with a flu jab. Go to the pharmacy and get, get one for yourself privately. Yeah. You're reliant on the government saying you can protect yourself. And, protect and that's something they also want that's to do with that, to, to give uh, private access to, to the jab as well. Welcome back. Uh, you are watching the press. Previous. OK, you can talk amongst yourselves. That's what, that's what you're here for. I love the way she nudged in. Oh, we're on. Uh, with me, as you can see, the deputy editor of Conservative Home, Henry Hill, and the Daily Mirror columnist, Susie Boniface. Uh, welcome back to you, both of you. Right, let's have a look at the Telegraph front page and, and this story about uh, Jeremy Hunt considering announcing a real terms benefit cut this autumn um, amid hopes the funds could be used for a tax giveaway next year before the general election. Mm. Henry. I mean, so, obviously, everyone's struggling with the cost of living crisis, and the government has, for the past year, been making a big deal of how it's been helping everyone with the cost of living crisis. And now, ahead of the general election, it's proposing that uh, benefits should not keep up with inflation. Now, this is going to be particularly difficult, I think, for the government to justify because of the pensions triple lock. So you're going to, at one end of this scale, you're going to have this nation's wealthiest age cohort, many of whom have property wealth and everything else, getting an 8% increase. And then you're going to have people on benefits receiving less than inflation. Now, it might be that that frees up some money for, for, ta for tax cuts and the government will target those in the election. But it creates an absolutely very tricky narrative. And I suspect what actually this might be about is Labour will pledge to reverse this, presumably, if they come into office. And that means that the Tories can attack them on spending. But it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a very uh, uh, strange decision, I think. Well, one of the biggest welfare benefits, of course, is pensions, which they promised to protect. So it's, it doesn't really make any sense. But you could rewrite that whole headline, just say, Sheriff of Nottingham heads for village with matches, because that's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Summed up uh, very <laughs> succinctly. Nothing new under there. Does he burn villages down? It doesn't sound good for the tax base. Right, he <laughs> hits it with his matches. If you pay yeah. the taxes or else it's, oh, you yeah, know... Oh, OK. Yeah. Right, we've just got time to have a look at uh, this story. It's only tiny... Paragraph uh, on the front of the FT, um, but this is um, a rebuild, a rebrand of Oxford Street, Henry? So, yeah, absolutely. Oxford Street, uh, theoretically London's premier shopping district for a while. It has been widely seen to be in steep decline. And so now there is apparently a concerted push by the various owners of the buildings and businesses there to try and revive it. But strangely, given that it was meant to be a destination shopping thing, they've got an Ikea. It's a strange place to have an Ikea, I think. You're, you're carrying, carrying all the furniture home. Um, and they're also going to have a crazy golf like, a, the world's largest crazy golf. Like, it's not really reviving it as a flagship shopping destination. I think they're just trying to get rid of the sweet shops and the money laundering fronts, which would be, at least be progress. But. Mm. <laughs> and, and HMV, uh, which I, get, I don't think it's going to be a great minute, but having a big indoor miniature thing and crazy golf, it's just inviting teenagers to carry on hanging about and all the rest of it. And, like I say, with an IKEA, I mean, how are you going to get the wardrobe mm. home? Uh, on the tube, choice. it doesn't make any you, sense. You contrast it with you know, Regent Street's right next to it. That is a premier shopping district. That presumably is what the model you would be looking for if you were trying to revive Oxford Street. And it sounds like they've kind of given up on it as a retail destination, mm -hmm. and they're just trying to find a slightly better use for those shops than selling yeah, mobile phones and it, overpriced American. Make it a candy. tourist destination, which it isn't at the moment. There are many cities around the world and in Europe where there are streets where you just have to go because it is the thing, and yet they're still attractive, and there is something 
something there for you and there is nothing there. If you come to Oxford Street in London, it's... Mm. Watch out for the machetes. It's it's not a place that you want to, that to go as a tourist. I don't think it's quite bad. It? And, and I think tourists do still head to Oxford Street, but yeah. um, we'll but they get disappointed them. once they're there. That's the problem. Mm. <laughs> Susie and Henry, thank you very much. In the headlines with the deputy editor of Conservative Home, Henry Hill, and Daily Mirror columnist Susie Boniface. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, the Times leads with a plea from the family of fugitive Daniel Khalif to hand himself in. Net zero obsession has fuelled inflation, according to Lord King on the front page of The Telegraph. He says it should not be the Bank of England's job to help the world with climate change. Andrew Flintoff is on the front page of The Sun, pictured for the first time since he was seriously injured in a crash while filming Top Gear. The Mirror leads with tributes paid to Queen Elizabeth II on the first anniversary of her death. They show the uh, Prince and uh, Princess of Wales pausing to remember whilst the King and Queen were in Balmoral. The weekend edition of the Financial Times leads with the continuing scandal surrounding degrading concrete in schools across the country. They say the government ignored warnings about dangerous buildings back in 2020. The Guardian says MPs have told the Prime Minister access to Covid jabs needs to be widened as concerns over the new Perola variant grow. The Daily Express leads with a new report claiming ministers must stop bowing to human rights rulings made by woke judges which benefit bogus asylum seekers, terrorists and strikers. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined by Susie and Henry. Thank you very much for being here uh, in the flesh, as it were. Um, let's kick off with a look at the uh, front page of The Times. And uh, this is the family of um, Daniel Khalif actually, well, putting out a, a message to him to hand himself in. Susie. Yep, so this is a close relative. We don't know exactly whom, but it's said that he's a he's a, a very intelligent.